Welcome to The Level, our main campus for the Bachelor of Digital Arts and Entertainment in Kortrijk, Belgium. We are part of the University College of the West and we proud ourselves to be a practice-focused, atypical and highly innovative school. Digital Arts and Entertainment has the goal to produce alumni with a strong hybrid profile of both technical and artistic skills, allowing them to successfully integrate into a pipeline both in the film and game industry. We truly believe in the importance of a shared language, so all our students, programmers and artists alike have to at least learn the basics of their counterpart. This formula has proven successful over the years. Our alumni have been well received all over the world. After multiple years of success in international competitions like the Rookies, our degree has grown immensely both in reputation and student numbers. Currently we have over 1200 students, 250 of them from abroad. This growth has allowed us to specialize and cater our courses closer to the individual trajectories. In its 14 years of existence, the EE has changed quite a bit, always keeping the tech art profile at its core. When digital arts entertainment first came to be, it was one single study track for students who wanted to become developers, as well as for those who wanted to become artists. The applied math course was there from the start, but it was taught traditional with a book, chalk and a blackboard. While this was working for the developers, who were usually comfortable with math, for the artists it felt like a best of series of all the things they hated in high school. Even though we knew that they would need the knowledge to build upon, for them it was hard to understand the relevance of the math. When they saw in later years what the math was used for, it was usually too late. As our school grew, we divided our students into more specialized majors. This provided an opportunity to tailor a math course specifically designed for the needs of 3D artists. Our Math Fundamentals course is being taught to first-year students that have just joined DIE to become artists in the industry. At this point, most of them have no 3D modeling or programming experience, none whatsoever. A lot of them are drawn to the visual components in visual effects and games, but sometimes they are not very eager to jump into technical topics such as math or programming unless they can clearly see what it is useful for. They are much more driven by visuals compared to their programming peers. So, we set out to find a tool that could also give us some visually pleasing results and get them used to the environment. The topics of our new Math Fundamentals course are essentially the same, but we wanted to find a radically new approach to show the students the relevance of what they have been learning. We started integrating Houdini in our VFX major at first. Our second year students got the first introduction in the VFX simulation course, which exposed them in a range of topics from procedural modeling and destruction to particles, smoke and fluids. The goal was to help them understand the basic concepts so they could later research a new topic on their own, like volume, fem, grains and chops. A lot of the teachers actually joined the simulations course in their own time because they wanted to learn more about the software. At the same time, in our in-house research division, was looking into Houdini as well. The goal of the research department is to expose the game and film technologies into other industries like tourism, industrial manufacturing, cultural heritage and healthcare. Just in two years, Houdini had established a big presence in our school. In this environment, it quickly became clear that Houdini might be exactly what we needed. Because of its data-driven approach, Houdini is more flexible than any other industry tool. After seeing that we could even plot functions using a creative setup with a small sphere and a trail node, we knew that we would not be limited by the possibilities of the software package. At that moment, we got some of our more technical art teachers together. What was especially helpful for us was the fact that we had a resident math teacher involved who had gone through all the different iterations of the prior course. She was very eager to learn Houdini, but at the same time, she could make sure that our focus did not shift away from the actual math. Once we started looking into Houdini, the main question quickly shifted from can we do it to can we do this with our new students? Our biggest fear was that it would become overwhelming for the students or overshadow the math content that we wanted to convey. You can do so much with the software, but if you have no prior knowledge of 3D modeling or programming, all of that is pretty daunting. I think a lot of people can relate to that overwhelming feeling that you get when you first start dipping your toes in the Houdini pool. But the nice part is that the user interface is flexible enough to hide a lot of the complexity, so we can focus on what is really important to us. So, in many areas, we have deliberately sacrificed features and practices in order to keep the course on point and confined to a very small part of Houdini. For example, we purposefully don't work with FETs, 
and instead we focus on manipulating simple geometry with the help of FOBs. The added benefit of working that way is that it's very similar to the other software that they will use down the line, such as Unreal Engine. The goal is not necessarily to teach them the Houdini software, that is just a happy side effect. They have follow-up classes for that in the semesters after. The sole goal of this course is to prime them with the mathematical foundations so they can use the full potential of Houdini and other software later on. We decided to just go with it and completely overhaul the course. When we transitioned the course towards Houdini, we made sure to provide exercises with visually interesting results. Amongst our favorite ones are a real-time watch based on a unit circle, a hovering spaceship with flickering lights all done with the help of sine waves, calculating the interaction between a sloped surface and a group of spheres, vector math to place snow on top of an object, or correctly align a steel bar during an animation. Every week, three modules work together to let the students develop a solid understanding of the mathematical concepts. At the core of the course is the weekly theory hour, which is a traditional lecture that explains the basics of trigonometry, functions and vectors. Of course, due to COVID measures, we had to move to an online format, uh, which is a live uh, streaming session. Also here in theory, we use a visual hands-on approach where we start from a graphical representation of a mathematical problem, show how the formulas work and also how they can be applied in a practical uh, 3D context. To further help with this goal, I developed an interactive mathematical tool where each slide is an interactive mathematical experiment that students can use at home to further expand their knowledge and to gain a deeper understanding of the material. Also included are self-help exercises where students can try exercises, see if they answered wrong or correctly, and also get an explanation of why they made a mistake. Aside from the theory lecture, we also have our demo. The goal of the demo is to apply the theory in the industry standard application that Houdini is, instead of using a more general mod software like GeoGebra, in which we used to teach. Like that, students immediately see the relevance of math in the VFX and game industry. In the demo, I talk about basic workflows in Houdini and how to translate the formulas into node-based solutions. We have set clear boundaries of what nodes we are using. We try to create everything with simple geometry, like a sphere, a box, a line, so no modeling. The node the student spends most of its time in is the attribute VOB node, within which the mod and vector VOB nodes are used. We also make use of the solver shop to create vector-driven animations, and I explain what those nodes do and how to use them, but what is even more important is what is happening in the geometry spreadsheet. On top of that, we try to inspire students by showing them real applications, even though some of these examples might be impossible for them to make themselves at this point, but we find it essential to show them what is possible. In the exercise section of each week, students have to solve practical problems with the help of math. Apart from strengthening their math understanding, our main goal for this part of the course is to teach students problem-solving abilities. We have a mix of exercises where the math is very clear, but also exercises that will require some creativity to solve. This aspect of the course is maybe even more important for the students than the actual math topics we teach. Our goal is to shape the student's mindset to see the math as one of their tools that they can use in their day-to-day -day work instead of being scared of it. The entire goal of changing the course was to trigger the interest in problem solving and after seeing some students turning simple sign of exercises into hard red monitors, we knew that we were on the right track. One of the most important topics we cover in the course are vectors and the operations. And after covering the basics in the previous weeks, we actually make our own shader with them to show them the relevance of the math that they already learned. I'm sure most people here are very comfortable with math already, but just in case, let's have a quick refresher. We can use our app for that and use it to illustrate what we are trying to show in Houdini. For the shader, we have to understand two separate concepts. As a first step, we have to be able to calculate the diffuse lighting. 
Uh, after we accomplish that, we then in a second step have to also calculate the reflected lighting, uh, otherwise known also as specular lighting. Let's have a look at diffuse lighting first. To keep things simple, we will work with a single triangle with one normal. We also need to calculate the vector pointing from the point to the light source. And after normalizing that vector, we only have to do the dot product between the normal and the light vector. And that results in a value between minus one and one. You can see here that if I move the light around, the values are constantly changing. You can see the value at the bottom of the app. If I move my light lower, we get negative values, so we have to take care of those with a clamp node in Houdini later. And that's it, uh, that's all the math we need to sh do some basic shading on geometry, so <laughs> quite shockingly simple, no? So let's try that in Houdini. This is the custom UI we use for our course. We very deliberately try to hide away the complexity from them, especially modeling and uh, effect tools, uh, so we can focus on the math and you can see here that the geometry spreadsheet really takes up a significant part of our UI. Why we want the students to always monitor what they're actually doing, how the data they are uh, working with is um, updating in real time. And the ability to do this was actually one of the main reasons that we picked Houdini for our course. Let's start by adding a simple sphere. Also set it to polygons so we can shade the individual surfaces. To be able to light us ourselves, we actually have to first get rid of all the lights in the scene. We also need to make our own dummy light source, which will be this red sphere here. I'll quickly add some unit circle math in the VOP to make it orbit around our object. We create this VOP to calculate the lighting in. Our light source has to be the second input so we can access its position. Okay, let's quickly have a look back at our app. We will need to calculate a normalized vector pointing at the light source, our red sphere here, and then we have to just do a dot product between the normal of the surface and that vector we just calculated. To do this now in VOPS, I just get the get attribute node and import the position of the sphere. And if I then take the point positions and subtract that light positions from it, then I have a vector that points in the right direction, and then all I have to do is still normalize it. If we then do the dot product between that vector and the normal, then we get a value between minus one and one. That's our light intensity, so we should also still apply a clamp node to get rid of the negative values. And then we can still also multiply this with a parameter called color to be able to color in the object a bit. As you can see here, if I click now on my animation and my light starts circling around, you will see it actually updating in real time on the object. As you can imagine, this is already a lot more satisfying to solve than just calculating it on paper and getting a value between minus one and one. The beauty of Houdini's nodes is that we can just replace the sphere now with a more complicated geometry and it just works. So let's plug in the rubber toy. And because all our shading is vertex based, it doesn't hurt to throw in a subdivide node for good measure. Okay, look at this. It even works with the animated light. That was surprisingly simple, no? The specular lighting is a little bit more complicated as it involves reflecting a vector as well. We show our students how to do this with math, but to save some time we can just use Houdini's reflect node today. We always want our students to first understand how it works, for example for a distance node that is actually based on Pythagoras, and then later they are allowed to use those shortcuts. It's very important to understand that the specular, unlike the diffuse lighting, is actually dependent on the observer as well. So we need to calculate the dot product between the reflected light vector as well as the vector pointing at the observer. To not overcomplicate this for our students, we give them a file that already has a camera added with it. And inside is also a sphere that is with some relative reference bound to the position of the camera. So they can use just this uh, sphere instead to calculate the vector that looks at the camera. To calculate the view vector, we need to input the sphere as a third input into our attribute VOP from before. Inside the VOP node, we can use the position of the camera to calculate a vector looking at the camera. Don't forget that all the vectors we are working here all have to be normalized. As I mentioned before, in our class, we would now continue with this with some vector math, but as a shortcut today, we'll just use the reflect node of Houdini to reflect our light vector against the normal. This clamp dot product is actually already our specular light now, but there will be some adjustments made to fine tune the look a little bit. To control the material properties, we can just add two other quick calculations. We can just power our result 
to steepen the transition between the non-specular and specular parts a bit, making it look more shiny. So that's our shininess parameter here. And we can just increase the total amount of specularity to the specular level. Those working in older shaders like Fong or Blin will recognize those as specular intensity and glossiness of the material. If we add all those calculations also in Houdini now, um, expose our parameters and set them up nicely, keeping in mind that if we have a high specular level, we usually also want a high shininess, then we already get a pretty good looking result actually. It looks especially nice in action if you start playing the animation. After showing them some other effects like Fernell, we asked our students as a transfer exercise in the exam to make a tune shader by themselves and we were very pleasantly surprised how many students managed to pull this off without any help of the internet. It was extremely rewarding for us to see students that started just three months ago with little to no math knowledge and now after the course they were actually able to pull those kind of problems off and it made all those hundreds of hours that we put into changing the course and rewriting everything absolutely worth it for us. Especially to point out again, this was not meant as a shader course. We have courses for that in the future and we are really excited to see how far we can push our students in the follow-up courses. As a direct follow-up course, all students will learn how to create procedural assets in Houdini where we use basic vector operations as part of the modeling process. The second year VFX students will have in-depth courses on simulations like rigid body, particles, vellum, pyro, and fluid solvers, which all benefit from the physics covered in the first year. Our second year game graphics students use the math fundamentals in environment art and real-time effects courses. For instance, when they are building particle systems in Niagara or making materials in the material editor in Unreal. At the same time, we have elective courses for those that want to further explore procedural modeling or take the next step and start tackling procedural environments as an integral part of a game pipeline. For those courses, we do focus a lot on Houdini as a tool, but the math from the year before supports that. Because of the changes to the original math course, it now feels a lot more integrated in the rest of the curriculum. We also saw in the follow-up courses that students were much more comfortable applying their knowledge to real-world problems. While the math topics stayed nearly the same, by changing the approach we could see a much better engagement in class. While solving the same problems in Houdini might be more complicated, it's also infinitely more rewarding, seeing the final result in action. Even strong math students still learn valuable skills like node-based programming and a better understanding of 3D, while for the other students the visual approach is very helpful. Even more rewarding for us was the fact that students who identified themselves as bad at math actually went through a change of mind during the semester. We did not expect this back of a positive impact in the first iteration of the course. Right now, we actually have quite a few last year students that consider themselves unfortunate to not have had the current iteration of the course. Looking back, we are very pleased with the decision to use Houdini as a tool for our basic math course. Even though it was a leap of faith, Houdini proved to be an amazing tool to bridge the gap between the technical and artistic aspects of our curriculum. The way Houdini exposes the technical aspects of 3D graphics makes it an ideal tool to train aspiring technical artists. This has strengthened our belief that we were right to further integrate Houdini into our curriculum.